the final eight is set. This most incredibly even of seasons has produced our eight finalists. Nathan Buckley, the stage is set for September, but also for you for another big edition yes. of the Buck Stops Here. Now, I'm going to do a little um, um, interlude at the beginning. I had to, just had a chat to you. What would you pay? What would you pay for a belly laugh a day? I actually had this conversation with a mate of mine. Just consider every all our listeners. How much would you invest to have a 30-second belly laugh in your day? And I'd I'd be interested to see or to hear some of the responses because I reckon there is a belly laugh is as valuable as anything that you have in your life. I reckon there's people that give you one, even more so. As a Carlton supporter this morning, you're paying top dollar, aren't you? Top dollar. All right. Uh, Yeah, that's move on from that. (laughs) That's not going to do it, Um, isn't it? All right, I'm going to start. I'm going to start with Collingwood and keep it sharp because I I do get criticised for potentially being a little bit Collingwood focused and uh, and positive, but it's hard not to be given what they've put together. And uh, Craig McRae was really when you look at the stat sheet, they're able they're winning um, when they're losing massive numbers in KPIs. Is so fascinating. You have to go back nine weeks to go to a game that they won contested ball, plus 13 against GWS. So going back there is minus 54 against Carlton, minus 29 against Sydney, minus 24 against Melbourne, minus 15, minus 13, minus 10, minus 10, minus 19, back to that game. You, They've only won the clearance stat twice in that nine weeks, and that is minus 12, minus 7, minus 20, minus 8, minus 15. So you cannot, you cannot gauge Collingwood's chances of winning on contests and clearance because their pressure is so good around the ball. The, the most important KPI for Collingwood is winning the next contest out of, out of a stoppage. So when the ball goes forward 30 metres or back 30 metres, if you're a side, you need to win that next contest because Collingwood keep winning those both in defence and offence. So you need to challenge them. And Carlton did that in the second and third quarter. They won when they won clearance and went forward, they went won that next contest more often in the second and third quarter, which gave them a chance to score and hold territory. That's the stat that you need to challenge Collingwood with, and that's the stat that they are probably number. I don't know, have a number for it, but num, they're they're right up there in the competition for winning contests outside of stoppage. So when Craig McRae says it's not sustainable. Well, the data would say it absolutely is sustainable. Well, Collingwood's efficiency in offense and defense is is the key, and they're 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 very they're like uh, they're surgical going forward, and they score really well when they when they turn the ball over, um, and their defensive attributes, their back six or seven in particular, are going really well. So the Pies, you can't judge them on key stats, and that's why they've been able to win. The other the other side of the equation was Carlton. What could have been. Um, it's a, a tough pill to swallow, but when the dust settles, it will be a really positive year for the, the Carlton Football Club. A, against Melbourne two weeks ago, they were eight points up with at the 29-minute mark. So this is a team that finished second in the competition after the home and away Melbourne, the, the reigning premiers. They lost that by five points with the last two goals of the game in the last minute and a half. They were 11 points up against Collingwood 20 minutes into the last quarter after leading by four goals at three-quarter time and, and a side that finished fourth. So Carlton have had two narrow losses in games that they looked like they were going to win against the two of the top four sides. So that's how close and how marginal it is. I need to mention Paddy Cripps, 35 touches, 27 contested, 18 of those in the front half, 12 clearances, eight inside 50s, five tackles. That these that was a final. That was an elimination for final for Carlton. Now they lost that. They they have been eliminated. So it was an elimination final. Vossi uses that. He finds out who stood up when we needed you, mm. and who's who who wilted. And you get you get to make decisions on players, and and you don't be surprised at who gets favoured, and who gets looked past when you go forward from here. Because if you don't stand up in big games, you, you quickly become superfluous to go taking that next step. So it's great. It's valuable information that, um, that Michael Voss and the Carlton football club have going forward. Uh, number three is Essendon. Um, and, and I think that there's no doubt that, um, that they have come forward. Um, they've made the decision on the coach, but there's a lot of uh, stuff that needs to get done, uh, for them to, um, get back to where they want to be. It's really interesting. It says to me that Essendon, 
don't believe they have the information internally to bridge the gap between where they are and being a, a highly successful, well-oiled football department. And that's a big red flag because yeah. if you've got no one in there that you believe is actually seeing it well enough, you're actually asking the senior part of that. I think you're asking someone to come in and be a savior for us as a senior coach. And that's not the way good programs are built. They're built with a, a spread of football intelligence, a spread of experience. Um, it's not just one person who comes in and says, this is my, this is the, my way or the highway. And I think they've narrowed like to actually expect oh, to, ha to have an, a, just an experienced coach, it's it's really narrowed the field. I don't know whether you need to have been a senior coach to have experience in football. There's plenty of assistant coaches that have had eight, nine, 10, 12, 15 years of experience in football departments that would have a wealth of um, of experience. And we've seen, like Craig mccrae has been coaching for the best part of 15 years coming out of playing. Um, we know Vossi's had a crack at it once and come back, but we, we've got guys that have come in and, and done really well, but haven't necessarily been exposed to senior coaching as well. So I hope they go a little bit wider than that. So yeah. they're going to run their coaching search in conjunction with their uh, long awaited external review process as well. So it's all going to be, it's a, it's a open art surgery at the moment at Essendon. And when you talk about their experienced coaches, so who does that? So that's that's Ross Lyon, Mark Williams, Don Pike, you know, Adam Simpson, I know he wants to stay at West Coast. Ken Inkley, I know he wants to stay at Port Adelaide. And then you go perhaps the guys that have coached now are assistants like our other guys, like Justin Lepich and the like. And your name came up as well, but can we, we can absolutely... Brent Sanderson. Uh, Brent Sanderson is another, another one who who um, who absolutely is, um, is yep. well-credentialed. Hey, can we just... Put a line yes. through. Yeah, I know how many times I have to answer that question, yeah. but yeah, I'm, the, where I'm at in my life and my family circumstances, coaching is not on the agenda. So it's not about North or it's not about Essendon. And this I is think across the board. Really clear. Yep. Yeah, I'm just not not looking at it at this point. Um, okay, don't need to be four. Don't us, don't underestimate Richmond. There's one stat that stacks up uh, in regards to their their capacity to score from turnover that is going to have a lot of sides worried going into September. Hardwick is talking about is controlling turnover. So it's your balance of offense and defense. And after Geelong and Sydney, Richmond are the next best team. So Geelong and Sydney are the two teams that that have the best efficiency in offense and still really good in defense. Richmond scored 200 goals from turnover this year. So no other, that's the highest number of goals scored from turnover. So they've put together an offensive profile that's going to worry a lot of sides in the home and away. The last time a team kicked 200 goals from turnover was in 2018 and Richmond kicked 210. That year, Melbourne, who didn't make finals, mm. kicked two, well, yeah, they did make finals, kicked 2010. Prelim. Sorry, two, sorry, two ten, 210 yep. uh, goals, both, both Richmond and Melbourne in, in 2018. And if you remember Adelaide, when they came on that rush in 2017, they did it on the back of that offensive transition. They kicked 234 goals in, in off turnover that year. But Richmond, the only team that's kicked 200 off turnover, the, and they've put that together over a whole season. So they've and they've and that's just heading north as well in and the what, last period. Of time. And what finalists have had their real issues defensively this year? The team they're playing, correct in week one. Yeah, well they've they've they've, they've They've opened themselves up because they like scoring oh. as well. But well, yes. Brisbane have had their issues keeping the back door locked. I mean, Richmond are going to be knocking repeatedly at the Gabba at that elimination final. Oh. And the, the last one's short and sharp, and it's it's probably you know fate accompli. It's it's a it, it's it's something that's staring us right in the face, and that's how clearly um, dominant Geelong have been throughout the year. And I just think they need kudos. They they've been able to put another home and away season together. That's just been the envy of plenty of other competitions. Geelong's just, uh, their, their capacity to maintain momentum through a year, to put themselves in great shape. They've managed and rested players over the last three or four weeks, and we've seen them do that really well in previous years. They've been in this position plenty of times. A, a percentage of 144, 18 wins, four losses. They couldn't, like young players that are coming through, Jeremy Cameron's a question mark, but they are as cherry ripe as they've ever been. And now it is it is their time to go and make the most of it in the next four weeks. And um, This is it, though. You, this can't, is it. you can't ask for any more. If you're a Geelong supporter, yeah, this is it, though. your coach, your football club, your players, you're in great shape. 
and then you go play Collingwood. This at, is at it. The MCG. This is, we've waited twelve months for this. So all Ge- Geelong supporters will tell you is we've been here before, Bucks. We've Two, been two thousand nineteen. We've been two thousand nineteen. Geelong finished first. Collingwood finished fourth. And uh, we were able to get the job done on that night. So they've won thirteen in a row. They've been well placed injury wise. You mentioned Jeremy Cameron. There might be a tiny query on Mitch Duncan, who by the time this first final rolls around, if he's picked, wouldn't have played for a few weeks. Mm. Might be a little hip concern with him. But they've managed it beautifully. They couldn't be better set up. And yet, for all of that, this is the bit where we've been waiting for Geelong, who have been so close and so well qualified and so consistent in the home and away season over the years. And yet, this is when they are truly about to be judged. Come September, and it's harsh to say that, isn't it? Because they've had a magnificent season. But if they can't frank it at the business end again under Chris Scott, as good as he's been, then the same old questions will come back to the surface. Yeah, well, we're, we're what ifing, and that's what we do. And we're what ifing on the experiences of the past. The only way you move past that is to is to do better. And and that's what, at least Geelong and the the coaching staff and the players they can do something about it. And they've set up a great environment. They. They just keep winning. Like Chris Scott's win record's over seventy percent as a coach. If you're going to win seven times out of ten, you're doing bloody well. Mm. And and they keep qualifying really well. Now's the time to make the most of it because there's never any guarantees. A hey, uh, Tezza is up in, in Greensboro. He's called in about uh, the Brisbane <laughs> Lions. Tezza, sorry to keep you waiting. No, no, no worries, boys. Good morning, boys. How are we? We're well. Yep. Yeah, just uh, I'm just a yeah, just a Lions fan. I watch week in week out. I've just got a couple of things like. We seem to have the one play. We, we're one-dimensional, whereas other sides can swing people back and forth. I've been saying it for a while now. I think the stay would be perfect down back as an intercept mark, a bit like McCartan and Liam Jones. And Daniel Rich, as much as I love him, he gets a lot of goals kicked on him. I think I think it's time to move him up to a wing or something. Like We just seem to have the same play each week. We, we don't mix things up. And, and I think in the off-season, we need to chase senior assistant coaches like... Some people with a bit of weight behind them, like the Carousellers or, or someone someone like that. That's 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 just my opinion, boys. But we, we seem one dimensional. Fair fair point and fair observation because Chris Fagan is a very um, he has confidence in the system that they have, the players that execute that system, and they've won a lot of games. They're not in form at the moment. They're not um, executing their plans as well, and that does have you look from the outside in saying, well, why don't you change a few things up? One thing I will say about McStay, he's a very good aerial player, but when the ball hits the ground, he there's not a lot there's not a lot of um, energy um, and and uh, and pressure that he puts on. He's not that good at his feet. So if you put him in the back half, you you actually need to have aerial capacity, but you still need to get the job done at ground level, um, especially when the ball hits the deck. So I'm not sure whether he's your man, but um, you're right. There's no doubt that. There's no doubt that uh, some coaches have an attitude of throwing things around and others prefer to back their 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 plan A. And Fags is definitely a, a coach who backs his plan A. And I don't reckon bringing in other assistants underneath him would change that too much. You'd need to, uh, if you wanted to be that, have that type of team or that type of football program, you'd have to change the guy at the top. But Fags has done a great job. Swans finishing third has some nice symmetry. They were third in 2005 and they were third in 2012. Everyone's looking for little omens, aren't they?